Thank you, everybody, and welcome to a special session of the Royal Economic Society. I am Tommaso Valletti uh, from Imperial College London, and together with uh, Andrea Galeotti from the London Business School, we organized this session. We are delighted to have uh, three amazing speakers on the topic of um, digital platforms and digital giants. You will see uh, three excellent papers with different angles on, uh, on this important topic. We will have a macro approach, a micro approach, and also some experiments. So we will start first with um, Bruno Pellegrino. Bruno Pellegrino has uh, written a paper that brings together um, a network approach. So a problem with, uh, with uh, the uh, sort of uh, trying to join IO and macro, which is a very exciting area. Every speaker will have 30 minutes overall. So 2025 for the presentation, and then there will be questions from the audience. Please make sure you write your questions, which I will read out loud to the speakers. And uh, without further ado, Bruno Pellegrino, University of Maryland, you are the first to go. And after 20 minutes, I will say, I will give you a, a warning. You have five minutes to the end. Bruno, the floor Great. is yours. Can you hear me loud and clear? And can you see the slides? Perfect. All right. So first of all, thanks a lot to Tommaso and Andrea for having my paper uh, on this uh, session. I'm super glad to be uh, presenting here. And uh, uh, let me start by giving you a little bit of the motivation behind this paper. So the idea is that there is a number of trends in the U.S. economy that seems to uh, suggest that there has been a broad-based uh, increase in oligopoly power. So we're seeing uh, industry concentration rising across many industries. And we're also seeing uh, uh, markups increase across many industries. Now, the research question that this paper uh, tries to address is, uh, can we actually go beyond just measuring markups and concentration? Can we actually say something about the welfare implications of oligopoly at the macro level? Okay. So and just to set the rules of the game, what, when I mean the welfare implication, I really mean the deadweight loss due to oligopoly, as well as the effect of oligopoly on consumer surplus. Now, this is obviously a very imposing methodological challenge in terms of the measurement we were trying to make, uh, because it's really uh, an, an industrial organization question asked in a macro setting. And this obviously create, comes with a lot of challenges. First of all, the standard tools of industrial organizations are not available when we move from a micro to a macro environment, either because they're not scalable or because there's a lack of data. In addition, uh, there's a much more deep and conceptual problem is that if you think about what is the first thing that we do uh, in an antitrust load suit, or when we estimate an empirical IO paper, the first thing we always do is to define a product market, right? Right? Now, the problem here is that when we are in a macro setting, we face the challenge of having to uh, define multiple potentially interlinked product markets all at the same time. And, and we have to do so in a systematic and objective way. And that's something that we really don't know how to do in a macro setting. So what does this paper do? Um, this paper first makes a methodological contribution. It, it sort of starts creating a toolbox to bring the tools of IO into macroeconomics. Specifically, the first thing I do in this paper uh, is I present a theory of oligopoly and markups in general equilibrium. What is the key uh, innovation of this theoretical approach uh, is basically to say, let's forget about industries altogether. Let's think of the product market as a network. Okay, So in this model, we're going to have a bunch of granular firms. So these are very large firms. Uh, they are going to play a network uh, game of oligopoly. And they're going to uh, compete with a bunch of uh, with a uh, with a competitive fringe of atomistic firms that can enter and exit endogenously. Now, uh, in order to model product market competition among these uh, oligopolies, uh, I introduce a new demand system called GHL, stands for Generalized Hedonic Linear, and this is really where the IO approach comes in. Hedonic demand is really the cornerstone of modern uh, empirical IO. And I'm going to show that this uh, demand system, we're going to be able to pick to the data and validate for the universe of US public corporations. And to do so, we're going to use some very nice product similarity data uh, developed by Oberg and Phillips. What can we do uh, with this new model once we take it to the data? Well, first thing, uh, we're going to answer an important question about markups. A big question about markups right now is, to, uh, is whether the rise of markups is actually due to uh, 
uh, a decrease in the availability of substitute products or whether it's driven by a thick right tail of highly productive firms that are pulling away from the competition. So with this model, we can, I'm gonna show you that we can decompose markups into two forces, one related to productivity and one linked into this, uh, this centrality in this network of products. And I'm gonna be a bit more clear what that means in a second. And then we're going to be able to do welfare measurements and counterfactuals. I'm going to show that the bad we lost due to oligopoly uh, is actually quite large. It's about 11.5% of total surplus uh, for the most recent year, which is 2019. And in addition, uh, uh, oligopoly leads to large distributional effects. It redistributes a surplus away from consumers and towards producers. Now, of course, this paper links to a, a lot of uh, different literatures in both macro and IO and networks. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of that and I'm going to dive straight into the theoretical model. Okay, so as I mentioned, the key building block of this new model is this demand system called GHL. Now, how does it work? Uh, we're going to have uh, N different firms uh, that behave as oligopolies and we are going to index them by I, okay? And the paper also show how to add uh, this competitive fringe of atomistic firms. Um, now, what does hedonic demand mean, the H in GHL? Uh, it means that we're gonna model products uh, as if they were bundles of characteristics, okay? And uh, in particular, I'm gonna make the following assumption, that one unit of each product I provides one unit of an idiosyncratic characteristic, also called I. This is a characteristic that is specific to that product, is not present in any other product. In addition, uh, one unit of product I provides a unit length vector of M common characteristics, uh, which we're gonna call AI, okay? What does that mean? Let me give you a very simple two by two example just to fix ideas. Um, so imagine a very simple economy with only two products, bread and cheese, and with only two characteristics that the consumer value, namely the carbohydrate and the fat content of each good. Now for each product, uh, we're going to have an associated vector of characteristics, A1 for bread, A2 for cheese, sorry. Um, and uh, the coordinates of these vectors uh, are going to tell us if we buy one unit of bread, how many units of carbohydrates and how many units of fat uh, the consumer gets, okay? Now notice uh, that uh, uh, there is a normalization assumption here uh, that all of the products lie on the unit circle. Okay, this is just a volumetric normalization. It doesn't have any effect on wealth. So it's without loss of generality, but it's gonna be convenient for the model derivations. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of the uh, vectors uh, of uh, characteristics and we're gonna stack them in a matrix that we call uppercase A. So all of the columns of this matrix are the characteristics vectors for each product. And then we're gonna take this matrix A and we're gonna multiply by a vector Q, which is the product bundle, okay? Each component of this vector Q is the units sold for each good, okay? So think of this as the shopping cart of the consumer. When we multiply A times Q, uh, we obtain X. What is X? X is the vector of characteristics aggregated across different products. Think of it, the total carbohydrate, the total fat, and so on and so forth for a given uh, shopping cart, okay? So X is the vector of common characteristics. Now, uh, who populates this economy? Let's model the, uh, we have, we're gonna have a consumer worker investor um, and we're gonna assume that this, uh, this consumer worker investors, it's a representative one, has a quadratic utility not over products, but over characteristics in line with the hedonic demand literature. Um, uh, in particular, it has quadratic uh, utility over X the, the, co the common characteristics, and over Q, the idiosyncratic characteristics. Q is also the quantity. Remember that the exchange rate of idiosyncratic characteristics to quantities is one to one, so we can just write Q here. Um, this consumer puts weight alpha on the common characteristics and puts weight one minus alpha on the idiosyncratic characteristics. Because we are in a general equilibrium setting, we also have a disutility for labor, H here, this is the number of hours of work supplied by this agent. And we're gonna assume that it's the numerator of the economy. So one unit of labor, $1. Now what's happening with this consumer is that this consumer faces a vector of prices, P, and he's gonna choose a demand function Q subject to some budget constraint. 
Now you solve the consumer problem and you end up with a very nice, uh, uh, simple linear demand system where again, this is the inverse demand. The P is the vector of prices. Q is the vector of quantities. B is the intercept of the demand system, the vector of intercepts. And sigma is the matrix of all cross price derivatives, all of the partial P, partial Q, okay? Now, sigma has a very simple expression. It's equal to alpha, the weight on the common characteristics times a matrix. Now, the idea is that the more weight the consumer puts on the common characteristic, the more the products become substitutable. So the more, uh, the higher the cross price demand elasticity is. Now, sigma is also uh, uh, proportional to this matrix A transpose A deprived of these uh, diagonal elements, which are one by construction. Now, what is this matrix A transpose A? Let's go back to the two by two example so that I can explain it. Now, remember each product of bread and cheese has its own ve uh, vector of characteristics, A1, A2. Now, when we take uh, the dot product of these two vectors, what we're doing geometrically is to compute the sign of the, uh, uh, the cosine of this angle, okay? And so the idea is the following. If two products contain a similar mix of characteristics, this angle is going to be tight, the cosine is going to be high, and therefore the cross price demand elasticity between bread and cheese is going to be high, okay? So here, the cross price elasticity depends on product similarity measured by this cosine. In fact, when you take the dot products for every pair of goods in the economy, you end up with a matrix A transpose A, which is in fact called the matrix of cosine similarities, okay? Now, uh, you're probably wondering at this point, why is this useful? Why are we doing this? The reason is that uh, the data of Hoberg and Phillips uh, is gonna give us a time varying estimate of this object for the universe of public firms in the United States and for every year between 1994 uh, and 2019, okay? So it's gonna allow us to take this, uh, this uh, model to the data. Now, a couple more assum uh, assumption. We assume that firms have a quadratic cost function. Sorry, so sorry, Bruno. Bruno, just, yes, just, Andrea. Sorry, uh, just a clarification question. Can you go to the previous? Uh, um, sure. So when, so when you say that Holbert and Phillips uh, give an estimate of this matrix, give an estimate of this cross pass elasticity or give uh, an estimate uh, of uh, the similarity? Of the similarity, excellent question. They give us an estimate of A transpose A and then through the lens of this demand uh, and through, okay. the, through the model itself, this is gonna be transformed into, into a full demand system. Excellent question, thank you. Now, we also assume that the cost function is quadratic. So H is both the labor demand, but also the total variable cost because uh, uh, labor is the numerator. Uh, C is the intercept and delta are the slope of the marginal cost function. And we assume that firms compete a la Cournot. So they're gonna choose a supply QI to maximize profits pi I, uh, which is just quadratic. Now, what we've done implicitly at this point is to construct what is called a linear quadratic network game. This is a class of game that has been extensively studied in the micro uh, theory literature. Uh, it's very tractable, but why is it a network game? The reason is that you can take this matrix of cosine similarities A transpose A, uh, which is uh, to which uh, sigma is proportional. And you can think of it as the adjacency matrix of a network. In fact, you can take the data set of other in Phillips uh, and you can plot it as a network. Now, what are you looking at here? Uh, this is basically sort of like a map of the product space. Each dot in this picture is a publicly traded firm in the United States. And the links between these dots represent product market similarity as measured by Hoberg and Phillips. Now, what is the intuition of this network oligopoly game that the firms are playing? The idea is that if I'm a firm that lives in a highly congested area of the product space, uh, it means that I have many other firms uh, that they produce products with similar characteristics. That means uh, that my products has many potential substitutes. I face a very uh, elastic residual demand function, and therefore I'm predicted to charge a low markup. Vice versa, if, you, if I'm a more isolated firm, I'm gonna behave more like a monopolist uh, and therefore I'm gonna charge a high markup, okay? So that's, uh, this is why basically the theory uh, is a theory of uh, markups in general equilibrium. 
Okay, and here is basically, in fact, how you can decompose the equilibrium markups of firms. So mu here is the markup of firm I, and you can show that in equilibrium, it's going to be equal to the average of one and the following ratio, omega divided by chi. What are omega and chi? Uh, sorry, omega is what I call the quality adjusted productivity. It's equal to B, the intercept of the demand function. Think of it as a measure of uh, vertical differentiation divided by the marginal cost. And the chi, the denominator of this ratio, is what I call the product market centrality. You can, uh, you can define it in two equivalent ways. It's either the output weighted degree centrality of firm I, or alternatively or equivalently, it's the shift in the residual demand of firm I that is induced by the, uh, the supplier uh, of, uh, of, the com of all of the competitors. And so the idea is that if I'm very central, again, I have many other firms with the, the producer similar products. I have a lot of competitive pressure and therefore I'm gonna charge a, high, a, a lower markup. Okay, so let's move into uh, the data. Um, so how, uh, so let me describe this uh, key data. Can I ask which you just, uh, Bruno, a clarification sure. question on uh, the theory side. The, the cost side, you have uh, assumed increasing marginal cost. How do you reconcile this with the view that they may be, you know, super stuff, um, so there may be economies of scale or something so, like that? How, how do excellent you question. The, in, uh, I, do, the, uh, I do not impose that, that the marginal cost uh, uh, function is increasing. It just, uh, I just assume that it's, uh, uh, that it's linear which means that the cost the total cost function is quadratic so it doesn't need to be um, increasing now uh, the, the um now uh, what do Holberg and Phillips do to come up with this science similarity data they basically exploit the fact that all public firms in the United States uh, by law have to file this form called the 10k with the SEC every year and if you open one of these 10k forms the first six to ten pages is a long and detailed description of the product that the firm sells uh, so what they did was to text mine these uh, uh, business descriptions uh, uh, for all firms now I should mention that this data set is already standard in finance it's already extensively used and one reason why uh, it's been so successful is that it solves a number of long-standing issues with traditional industry classifications, such as Nike's or SIG. Namely, these uh, classifications are static. They don't, they don't really get updated over time. They are binary, so firms are either in the same industry or they're not. But most importantly, uh, they don't really reflect product market competition. So it's a, that's the reason why they're never used in I.O. to estimate the demand systems. Now, how do you go from a textual description of the products to measure of cosine similarity? The first step is to create a vocabulary of words that, that identify product characteristics. Hoberg and Phillips have about 60,000 of them. And then for each firm I, you go and, uh, and look in the textual description of the product, how many times each of these words shows up, okay? So you create a vector O of word occurrences. Then, in the same way that we have done in the theoretical model, you normalize this vector, you divide by the Euclidean norm, so you bring all of the firms back to the unit circle, and then you take all of the dot products and you end up with the matrix A transpose A. Now, we are estimating a demand system here. So what is the identifying assumption? The identifying assumption is that words act as proxies for characteristic load. Does it work? Well, both the paper of Albert and Phillips and this particular paper do extensive validation of this approach to show that it actually works. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get into the details. Um, I'm just gonna give you a few more uh, 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 information about the, how the model is calibrated. So what else do we need? We need revenues and variable costs from CompuStat. We use COGS as measure of variable cost. Then we need to calibrate uh, Delta, so that's the, marginal cost slope for each firm. Uh, this one is, uh, is calibrated to match average markups estimated by the Locker, Eckhart, and Unger in their famous QJ paper. And then the only other moving part is alpha. This is the weight on the common characteristics. And the way that this one is calibrated is uh, I take a bunch of in, uh, IO studies that estimate demand econometrically. I match uh, uh, cr their cross price elasticities uh, to specific firm pairs in my data set, and then uh, alpha is used to basically match those cross price elasticities. Now, given these two objects, everything else in the model is identified, and you have closed form expressions for output prices, all in the correct normalization, 
profits, consumer surplus, markups, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now let's move into the empirics. We now been able to take the model to the data. Uh, what do we find? Uh, first, let's operationalize the markup decomposition. What I'm showing here is the same object of interest of the local account. That's the revenue weighted average markups. And uh, here I'm basically decomposing the rise of markups into these two forces, one due to product market centrality and the other due to quality adjusted productivity. And as you can see from this graph, both forces are contributing substantially to the rise of markets. However, they do so across different markets. So this is revenue weighted markups. If you weight by uh, variable cost, you see that the, um, uh, the productivity component disappears completely and you're left with exactly the same uh, product market centrality component. What does this mean? It means that uh, the productivity component uh, acts for a reallocation of market shares uh, to high productivity, high markup firms. Instead, the product market centrality components acts for within firms, okay? And so uh, this is important because it puts discipline on what a theory of rising markups needs to have in order to explain uh, uh, in order to explain the data. So we have, uh, this already tells us a lot about rising markups, but we can do more. We can basically compute a total surplus for the universe of public firms, which is what I do in this uh, uh, graph. And I'm decomposing total surplus into profits. That's a light blue area and consumer surplus. That's the dark blue area, okay? Now both, are in, so they, those are plotted on the left axis in trillions of dollars. Both are rising, as you would expect. And uh, on the right axis, I'm plotting with the um, dotted black line, the profits as a percentage of the total. So the dotted black line is telling us the profits are rising more than proportionally with respect to uh, total surplus. And so the, uh, the share of surplus that goes to the producer increases over time from about 50% to 56%. So this is the distributional aspect of the increase in oligopoly. Basically, the, uh, the producer captures over time a larger share of the pie. There's also, of course, an efficiency aspect to the increase in, uh, in oligopoly power, which is given by the deadweight loss. So the deadweight loss tells us in percentage points, how, many, how much more total surplus uh, do we get uh, if firms are forced to uh, behave as atomistic competitors? This number increases over time from about 8.5% in 1995 to about 11.5% in 2019. So there's been an increase in the efficiency loss uh, uh, given by oligopoly. That's the uh, dark blue line. Uh, there's also the light blue uh, line. Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but think of it as a correct deadway loss that accounts for fixed cost. That's also increasing over time. And it's telling us that basically this, uh, this increase in oligopoly doesn't seem to be driven by a larger uh, share of uh, fixed cost in the firm's production function. Okay. Apolis Bruno, you have about five minutes before Excellent. the end. Those should be and plenty. Great. And I also would like to remind people in the audience that they can start typing questions for you so that I can read them. Excellent. So. Now, let me, uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to try and use the IO side of the model. So we have an IO style model in macro. We can do IO style counterfactual in some, and they can help us uh, sort of understand a little bit better what is driving these trends. Uh, and one thing that I looked at uh, in this paper uh, is basically at the production function for new firms. So what are you looking at here in this graph is the history of venture capital backed startups in the United States since 1985. The blue bars are the new IPOs and the, the light bars are the M&A exits. So what basically this picture is telling you that over time, it's not that we have too few startups, we have a lot of new startups, but basically all of them are choosing to get acquired, okay? And very few of them nowadays, uh, they are um, exiting through an IPO. So in the, in the final section of the paper, I basically, uh, I use this data to construct a counterfactual where I try and imagine what will happen to the equilibrium if uh, all of these, uh, if the ratio of IPO to, uh, to acquisition had stayed constant after 1995. So in this picture, the light blue line is the loss in consumer surplus. It combines both the that way loss, uh, both the efficiency and the distributional aspect. Um, it's rising over time, the consumer surplus loss in, in line with what we've seen before. 
um, in the dark blue line is the counterfactual scenario where we uh, where we keep uh, the ratio of IPOs to MA constant after 1997. And basically it's almost flat. Okay, so a lot of the, uh, so uh, of course there's nothing causal about this exercise, but it's telling you then just from a quantitative point of view, um, this, uh, uh, this secular shift from uh, uh, IPOs to acquisition has a lot of uh, quantitative power at quantitative by to explain this trend, okay? Now, the, this is a session about the uh, uh, digital uh, 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 giants and market power. So another interesting thing that we can do with this model is can basically look at the cross-section of firms. So we can call each firm by name. Each firm in the model is a real firm in the data. And so uh, what we can do is basically we can look at the dynamics of markups of different firms and see where, what they're driven by. So in particular, what I'm showing here is the contribution of the product market centrality component. This is basically the lack of substitute uh, products uh, to various groups of firms. The dark black line, the dotted black line is, the, uh, is Google, Apple, Facebook, App, Amazon, and Microsoft, okay? So the digital giants, and as you can see, uh, for these firms, uh, centrality is making an enormous contribution to uh, rising markups. And uh, the other two lines, the light uh, blue line is the rest of CompuStat, and the dark blue line is other tech firms. So uh, as you can see, for, in light, for, the lights, uh, for the lens of the model, indeed, there's something uh, interesting happening uh, from the um, point of view of pure market power to these firms. It looks like uh, these uh, large tech giants have fewer and fewer substitutes uh, available, okay? So now I guess I'm almost out of time. So I guess it's a good time to wrap up. So uh, what have we done in this uh, uh, today? I'm shown that uh, I presented a new general equilibrium model of oligopoly with a new hedonic demand system. I've shown how to take the model to the data for the universe of CompuStat firms using uh, product similarity data that comes from 10Ks, uh, 10K forms. Uh, I've shown that there has been a rise in oligopoly power, not measured by concentration of markups, uh, but in terms of welfare relevant measures. So as a higher deadweight loss and a lower consumer surplus share. So again, there's been an, there is an efficiency, but also a distributional aspect to the rise of oligopoly. I've shown how there's a potentially important role for startup acquisition in determining this trend. And just to conclude, I want to advertise some follow-up work that I'm doing with Florian Eder. Uh, we generalized this model to common ownership. Uh, we had a new source of data, the uh, basically uh, institutional shareholding data from 13 forms, and we basically use it to study the welfare implication of uh, rising common ownership at the macro level. So uh, same basic machinery, but a completely new application of the, uh, of the model. And with that, I got to the end of my uh, presentation, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much, Bruno. Um, fantastic presentation and fascinating topic, which tries to reconcile markets and a macro approach. A first question that was put in the chat was, you told us about GAFAM and the markups of the GAFAM. What about the similar exercise when it comes to the acquisitions? Have you seen uh, what happened to the, to, you know, IPOs versus acquisitions specific to because the comment was more than a thousand acquisitions in the past 20 years came from the GAFAM and none was actually was actually uh, ever challenged by enforcers. Can you say something about that? Yes, so I basically, I don't have a specific uh, graph to show you about that, but basically I've collected some additional data uh, they didn't make it into the final paper about uh, the acquisition of the GAFAM firms, basically, uh, I estimated that the uh, that GAFAM firms are 30 times as likely to carry out an acquisition as any other firm in CompuStat, uh, and they have carried out about 600 acquisitions since the uh, uh, since mid 90s. So in terms of just uh, uh, so it's a pretty striking number. And I uh, and if you're interested in the markups, uh, the same uh, uh, counterfactual exercise can be done to basically look at uh, what percentage of the rise of markups. Uh, of these uh, GAFAM firms uh, can be explained by these rising uh, acquisitions. So, a related yeah. question from the audience is, um, how can you, how can the enforcers use your analysis in uh, actual antitrust cases? How can your analysis be helpful to an antitrust authority? So the, uh, I think the best uh, use of this particular model is to sort of, uh, is to sort of monitor 
we, in which sector in particular, we, not sector because the model doesn't have sector, but which parts of the product space uh, is market power more likely to be building up. I'm not arguing that you should use this model to actually uh, uh, model specific mergers. Obviously for that, uh, uh, you're like the antitrust authorities are likely to have access to much, uh, much more granular data from the firms themselves. Uh, but I think this is sort of a, uh, this, uh, uh, this model can be particularly useful to monitor changes in market power in sectors that are not usually uh, well covered by traditional uh, IO data. And I think uh, this, uh, uh, the tech sector is potentially one of these sectors. Hey, Tommaso, can I ask a question? Andrea, by all means. Yeah. Uh, so it is a donic model um, only allow for substitute products. And uh, when I think about product markets, there are a lot of products which are complement. And, uh, and it seems strange that, uh, you know, these complement products also have an effect on, on the competition. And uh, I just don't understand how, you know, essentially the, the old estimation that you have and the basic model rule out uh, the presence of complementarity across products. Yes, and, I actually uh, have a... a... Uh, a graphical response to that. I, let me see if I can find it. Uh, okay, no, I actually don't have the, uh, the, the graph to explain this, but basically uh, this model actually does allow for, compl uh, for strategic complementarity between firms. And so uh, just with a very simple example, imagine two firms that compete, they produce uh, completely uh, separate products in the sense they don't have any loadings on any common characteristics, okay? So these firms have similarity zero, but but imagine that these two firms have a firm in the middle that, to which both firms uh, have some degree of similarity. No, now, no, no, I understand. Yeah. Now, if uh, basically uh, the firm, uh, the first firm gets shocked in their productivity, so they uh, basically increase their supply, the firm in the middle receives a, a negative uh, residual demand shock. Okay, so that second firm reduces their supply. But this indirectly generates a positive spillover for firm three. So the firm, uh, the the third firm that is on, in, initially uh, not connected to the first firm, uh, basically ends up with a positive residual demand shock. So uh, it's true that all cosine similarities are positive by uh, by construction, but this actually this network approach actually generates very interesting strategic complementarity. It generates sort of like a rich set of. Uh, um, of uh, strategic interaction between firms. Does that answer your question? We need we need to move on. I'm afraid uh, we, we are afraid, okay. Andrea and, uh, and Bruno. This uh, Italian connection has to stop because we are going to the next uh, presentation. Thanks again, Bruno. Fantastic. The next presenter is Özlem Bedre de Feuille from ESMT in uh, Berlin. She's going to present a very micro paper now. The question is really an I.O. question about the platform models. In particular, think about Amazon. Amazon, you can say it's great because it has created a market, but it is also competing against uh, the same uh, firms that they are accommodating. So as uh, Elizabeth Warren said, it's both a referee and a player, and this generates uh, tension. So uh, the paper of Özlem with Simon Anderson is about understanding those tensions in a platform market. Özlem, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. Thank you, Andrea, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting session. I'm very pleased to share this uh, research with you. So as Tomas already mentioned, let me just uh, go straight uh, to the main motivation why we are doing what we are doing in this paper. As we all know, uh, e-commerce has, has become the major part of the retail revenue in most developed economies. Uh, if you want numbers, it accounts for around 16% on average uh, European retail revenue generated from e-commerce. And this number can go up to 25%, for instance, for countries like Germany or UK. And if you look at the e-commerce markets, we see Amazon being a very dominant player with market shares about 30%. But obviously, um, we, we are not only interested in just the market shares, as we know from the recent regulatory discussion, we're also interested in this, what uh, regulators uh, introduce this gatekeeper role of the digital marketplaces. Uh, that means that they are the only access for millions of sellers to reach the consumers. So that makes them a uh, gatekeeper. And the same way they are the access 
uh, for millions of consumers uh, to reach the other side, the seller side. And Amazon is a marketplace and it's uh, also a reseller in the same market. So this is this referee and the player in the same game at the same time. So that makes it hybrid. And if you look at the share of the volume of trade generated by Amazon, it generates uh, a little bit more than the 50% of its uh, total volume from third party uh, product sales. But it also sells its own products like Amazon Basics or Amazon uh, purchases from branded manufacturers and resells them as a reseller. And we don't know, have the numbers about the revenue shares, but this is just for the volume of shares. And for the US, for instance, approximately 37% of the third party sellers rely on Amazon as their only access to consumers. That, that makes Amazon uh, very important and the gatekeeper uh, marketplace for those sellers. So we have also other gatekeeper platforms as named uh, in the several uh, regulatory reports uh, recently. So Apple App Store uh, is regarded as a gatekeeper in Europe, according to the Digital Markets Act, based on its number of uh, customers on the app developer side, as well as on the consumer side, but also the Google Play, uh, Google's uh, App Store, and also this, you know, you might think it's a small uh, like fashion platform on European market Zalando, which also qualifies to be a gatekeeper because of its number of uh, branded product manufacturers selling their products on Zalando, as well as its number of customers on the buyer side. So what is the main concern around this uh, dominant digital uh, hybrid platforms? Basically, their practices vis-a-vis uh, -vis their third party sellers. So do they impose some restrictions that might create uh, anti-competitive outcomes or raising prices for consumers or lowering quality, or maybe harming also third party sellers entry and reducing competition, okay? So there are key concerns are like, could be classified under three uh, broad categories. So one is distorted access, because if they are gatekeeper, they might distort access of those third party sellers to consumers and the consumers access to third party sellers because they are like big players between these two groups of customers, uh, users. And they might also use their power to fare their own products because at the end they are competing against third party products. Why not Amazon wants to always favor its own product which is also known as steering consumers towards its own product. And that creates a uh, potential anti-competitive outcomes. And they might be also using this third party data in order to inform their own decisions on the retail channel. So that could be, for instance, learning from which products are very successful, and then Amazon introduces its own version of that product. So these are key concerns. But if you look at the, what's going on, it's not only antitrust cases anymore. So we have ongoing antitrust cases, both in Europe and US around Amazon and app stores. But also now we have very, uh, very recent uh, European law, which just passed last month, March, uh, Digital Markets Act become a law that basically prevents gatekeeper platforms from practicing these uh, things that are listed as concerns. So they are not allowed to steer the consumers towards their own products and they are not allowed to use third party sales data for their own decisions and they are not allowed to distort access. Okay. And in the US, it's still a proposal. So we have five bills introduced in June 2021. And one of those bills proposes to ban uh, basically hybrid uh, platform mode, in, in other words, separation of this, um, you know, we can think about it vertically separating uh, these platforms from uh, being just either marketplace or a reseller, but not doing both at the same time. So what we do in this paper is basically try to first understand this problem, how this market structure, vertically integrated marketplaces, would imply for consumers and the third party sellers in terms of prices and the consumer surplus and also the, the outcome like quality or the variety of the products and the marketplace. But in order to do that, we realize that we need a model to study e-commerce platforms, which is uh, containing this um, asymmetric stand between platform owning a big junk of products and facing uh, tiny sellers. Each of them are very small to affect the market, but at the same time, they make some profits from the market and they are selling differentiated products. So that's why we come up with this mixed market demand system as the first contribution in that paper to study e-commerce markets with long tail of products and the asymmetric demand structure. And using the model, then we study how this dual role of a monopoly platform affects 
prices variety and consumer welfare. So the main key takeaway out of this uh, analysis for policymakers is that what we find is this hybrid structure gives incentives to the platform to raise the rival's costs by in increasing commissions compared to a pure marketplace base. Okay, so this is what we call insidious steering because it is not as explicit as diverting sales via recommendations or rankings. It is implicit via the commissions. And the second key result of the paper is that if you ban the hybrid mode, what would happen will depend on where the platform will switch to. If it switches to pure marketplace mode, then it's good news for consumers, okay? And for the sake of time, I'm gonna go direct into what we are modeling here. Uh, so we have one, we think about only one platform because we want to understand this gatekeeper role. And they think about a continuum of sellers uh, they rely on platform as their only access. In other words, those sellers do not have an alternative channel. This is important assumption of this uh, model. And we have a mass of buyers on the other side, and then platform first acts and chooses uh, whether it wants to introduce its own products. This is product A or AJs uh, to the platform, basically whether I want to be uh, having this vertically integrated structure and selling on my marketplace or not. And if it sells its products, it chooses its own price PAJ for the product of the platform AJ, okay? And it also sets the commission on third-party sellers' products, sales revenue. This is a percentage commission T, and it chooses that T. After observing the platform actions, uh, sellers decide whether to come to the platform that incurs, uh, they incur have to incur a fixed cost of entry, and this can be think about establishing relationship with the platform, and then they choose their own price PJs, okay? And at the same time, simultaneously, consumers decide whether to visit the platform. They also incur an intrinsic visiting cost. And once they are on the platform, they see the products available on the platform. So they have this uh, utilities that depend on their random match values to the products in a standard uh, discrete choice model, but also it depends on the quality of the product. So it could be quality of the product A, so the platform product minus the price of the product plus this uh, random utility portion. And the MU denotes this, uh, the differentiation across the products. So we have three different types of product buckets. So we have outside option, that could be masses of products there, and that has deterministic value zero and it has random utility component only. And we have this fringe products or the products sold by third party sellers. It has a the quality V and the price PJ and also the random component and the platform product if available, it can have also different quality and the price. And then consumers realize those match values and decide basically comparing these utilities which product to purchase. Okay, so why do we call mix oligopoly? So basically we assume that the platform owns mass M of products in its marketplace. So it's the reseller for of the mass M of products, but each individual seller is tiny. So there, there is a mass N of fringe sellers, but each of them is very tiny. So this is called mixed oligopoly used by general equilibrium and the international trade literature. And different from this literature here, our dominant or the big player is also able to tax the rivals. So that's a key component that's different from this literature. Um, the structure of the demand system. And we assume those match values or the taste values of the products are IID with the Gumbel or extreme value type fund distribution. This is important to derive the logic type demands, hopefully could be also used for the empirical studies of these markets. And we also have this two-sidedness of the market generated from, you know, consumers don't know the match values before coming. So they have this elastic participation demand due to this intrinsic uh, search costs or the visiting cost. So number of consumers coming depend on number of fringe products differentiated on the platform and vice versa. So the number of platform, so the products entering the platform depends on the amount of consumer entry. But today I'm on only co consider the case where those costs are not big. So all consumers visit the platform, basically shutting down this two-sidedness, but just focusing on the main aspects of the main mechanism, the results there, but indeed, in the two-sided market setup, also we have similar structure, but obviously we have also some more richer uh, effects going on as well due to the network effects. And we also have this long run aggregative game structure, which gives us tractability, and it is generated from this free entry of sellers. So each seller is differentiated. So we have this mess of them, but they are still able to make some profit 
And in equilibrium, obviously they come until the profits are reaching to zero. And that generates the number of sellers coming endogenously in the model. And that also makes this game as a long run aggregative game. And that will give us attractivity. And more importantly, the platform playing the Stuckelberg leadership is important aspect that's also very important to emphasize. The platform has this reputation or the power of acting first, which gives also advantage strategically in this structure. And this type of games or longer aggregative games with Stuckelberg leadership were also used in the IO literature. But again, our first mover or the Stuckelberg leader is the platform that's able to tax the rival, which comes in in the following stage of the market, no, of the time. Okay. So again, I will just present today uh, what we find in the, the, in the case where we don't have uh, two-sided network effects, but only one-sided, but still we have basically sellers choosing whether to come, but the consumer side, everybody joins, but they just decide what to buy on platform. Suppose that we have this mass N of fringe products and mass M of products by the platform and that's mass one of outside or non-purchase options that consumers can choose from if they don't want to buy uh, from the platform products, okay? So why do we need masses? Uh, if we have mass of platform products, but there's only discrete number of outside goods, Obviously, IID draws is that inside goods always dominate the outside goods. So we have to come up with this demand structure that accommodates masses in each bucket. And so we have to draw basically say K draws from each bucket, but we have to draw those Ks proportional to the, 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 the size of those buckets. In other words, we have K draws from the outside wood, we have K N draws from the fringe goods, and we have K M drops from the platform product. And then by taking K to infinity, we drive logic type demand structure for this uh, the products. This is basically, I'm saying logic type because it really looks like logic, except that instead of having the summations in the denominator for the contribution of each product, we have integrals over the indices of the products, okay? And this is important because uh, what it tells us is you have, we will be very much focusing on the denominator or the market size in the, the logic demand, which is the denominator of the this, uh, demand function, and we will call it the aggregate. And that's, uh, that will be a big, uh, important, uh, basically, tool that we use to drive our results in a tractable way. So we can drive the demand for parent product J in this form and demand for, for uh, platform product AJ in this form. And when the platform product is not available, then we basically set the mass of the platform products to zero, M is zero, and that gives also the quality quantity of the platform product AJ to zero, demand AJ to zero, okay? So once we get this demand structure, we can write down the seller's optimal decisions of how to charge uh, the prices given the commission set by the platform. So sellers can keep only a portion of the price that they gain from their sales. So that's basically one minus T after paying the tax to the platform and they incur their marginal cost. And this is the sales, basically each J firm demand. And this is this logic demand with the contribution of the J product. And I denote now the denominated by A because this is also named as the aggregate in the aggregative game literature and this aggregate looks takes this form basically we have this portion of the product coming from the contributions of the platform product there is a mass m of them if platform is hybrid and this is equal to zero basically if platform is pure marketplace okay so the pure the platform presence basically changes definition of the aggregate in the demand structure but what is important is that this aggregate is independent of seller j's price because those sellers are tiny and they cannot affect equilibrium. So that's the key aspect that also gives us both tractability and also capturing this tiny sellers on this big uh, digital platforms. So the, in equilibrium, each platform seller sets its perceived marginal cost, which is basically reflecting the tax that it pays plus the standard logit markup mu. Okay, again, mu was the parameter measuring differentiation between the products. And this is also true whether the platform is hybrid or pure marketplace, because what changes is just the aggregate, which is constant anyways in PJ, okay? So this is a very simple and it gives us very tractable framework. And then we set basically by free entry condition, 
we can get the equality of the aggregate in equilibrium as a only a function of the commission set by the platform. This is what we call aggregate neutrality. And this is again coming from the long run aggregative games literature because of the spree entry condition closing the demand model. And that implies that the aggregate does not depend on platform pricing of its own products or platform products quality. It only depends on them indirectly via changing the commissions. Okay, And this is going to be a decreasing function of the commission. So the total market size, if you want to think about it, the denominator of the logit is going to be shrinking when the commission of the platform increases. Okay, And this will be important because then when we study optimal commission or the optimal pricing problem of the platform, having this aggregate neutrality will help us a lot to also simplify our analysis. But indeed, I should say it maybe here, aggregate neutrality is not necessary for the results of this paper, but it really simplifies the framework uh, significantly. So optimal markup is then given by this uh, MA. So this is the markup, so price minus cost of the platform product. And this is equal to, again, standard logic markup plus something what we call the opportunity cost of selling your own products. So when you are selling third party products and making revenues from them, those revenues are the opportunity cost of selling your own products. So the platform balances two revenue channels. It gets its own product markup, but also whenever I sell my product, I'm giving away revenues I can obtain from the third party product sellers. And that will determine how I'm gonna price. So I'm internalizing this, you know, the cannibalization between the products. And when the platform is hybrid, our main result is that when in that scenario that platform chooses to be hybrid, a better platform product in terms of better quality of the product, that will be the VA in the, the demand specification or lower cost. So that's why we call it like a kind of a higher advantage of the platform product. If it increases, that's going to result in higher commissions on third party sellers. Okay, so platform, when it has better products, it's going to increase the commissions on third party sellers. And this is directly imply lower consumer surplus, because in that model, as we know from the, the logit model, the consumer surplus is just a log sum, which is basically log of the market size. And we know that this aggregate only depends on the commission. And if commission goes down, consumer surplus goes down. Okay, so it is surprising because uh, what we are saying here is that platform having better products harm consumers. Okay, it's not obvious why it should be the case. It is indeed not the case in most of in all IO models. So let's try to understand why we obtain this result. So I here show very simply platform profit channel. So one is its own product MA uh, margin times the demand of the its own products. So contribution of own products divided by this aggregate, which is the denominator of the logic demand. And on the other side, platform also makes revenues per unit commission times the price of the third party seller and the demand of the third party sellers. So this is basically total market size minus my share minus outside share, okay? And this is multiplied by, again, divided by the aggregate. So what happens when my product quality, A quality goes up? Then I am able to capture a larger share of the total market size and total market size is neutral. It doesn't change in my quality of the product, okay? This is the aggregate neutrality result. So that's, be that's because of that, that means the fraction that I put in front of my own markup goes up. And fraction that I put in front of the other third party products markup goes down. So that means rebalancing my revenue channels and I have incentives to raise commission because that's gonna raise my rival's cost. And that's gonna imply higher uh, basically uh, sales for my own product and that's profitable, okay? So in other words, this better product doesn't benefit consumers because of the platform's business model. And then five we minutes. can also, yeah, five minutes. Five. We can also do the same comparative stat with respect to the range of the platform product or the size of the platform product M. It will be the same story. Increasing M will lead to higher commissions. And uh, basically that means uh, lower consumer surplus via two channels because higher commissions means fewer third party sellers come. And that means less variety in the differentiated framework but also higher consumer prices because those commissions are reflected on the prices of those sellers, okay? 
So then if you ask a question, when do the, does the platform choose to be hybrid versus pure marketplace? Because I haven't specified that yet. I just look at the case when it is hybrid and it depends on several things. So let's first start with the first scenario. Suppose that my products have no fixed costs. Okay, they have marginal cost, but now have fixed costs. It's always good to have my own products on the platform because of the consumer taste for variety in that model. So that means this orange line, the profits of the platform in the hybrid always lie above this green, the platform profits under the pure marketplace mode. Green is constant in the platform product quality because they don't exist because it's the pure marketplace. Whenever my product has some fixed costs, those are gonna shift down my product pro profits from the hybrid mode. So this will give us a cutoff below which platform prefers to be pure marketplace and above which it is hybrid, okay? And this cutoff will increase when my fixed costs are gonna be higher for my products. What is more important is to understand consumer welfare implications of this switching point. When, I am, when the platform chooses to be pure marketplace, consumer welfare is constant in platform product quality because it doesn't exist. Once it switches to hybrid, as we have shown in the hybrid mode, the quality increase of the platform product lowers consumer welfare. So there's gonna be a jump in this shifting point, okay? So that suggests that if we ban hybrid mode and if platform switches to pure marketplace, it's gonna be good news for consumers. But platform might also choose to be a pure reseller. That means shutting down its own marketplace. And in that case, it might be bad news for the consumers. So indeed, we characterize also another cutoff that's basically by looking at the profitability of pre reseller mode. This is this blue line in the first uh, graph that is increasing faster in my own quality because I don't have other products. And this is gonna give us this high cutoff above which I prefer to be just selling my own products. So if my products are really great, I'm pure reseller, but there is this interior region where I prefer to be hybrid. And if we ban hybrid, then if platform product, if platform switches to pure marketplace, then it's going to be good news for consumers. But if it switches to uh, pure reseller, shutting down the marketplace, then it's going to be bad news for consumers. So this is the, basically the un, you know the unintended consequences of a ban, structural ban on on this hybrid mode. But even if we don't ban it within the hybrid regime, we can think about in distortions. This is what we first document this insidious steering, but we, we also look at this explicit steering incentives and we show that platform only wants to do that if his products are good enough, because it's, it makes sense. I'm making money from the others. I don't want to always steer people towards other products. I want to do it if my products are better than the others, okay? And finally, I think I don't have time. I don't, maybe one last minute, the taxation issue, because I think this is an alternative uh, tool that the regulators or policymakers can think about it because there is a taxation in France, digital services tax imposed on marketplace of Amazon 3% and Amazon basically raised its commission to the third parties by exactly the same amount, okay? What we look at in this paper is basically what type of tax would be the better tax, okay? If you impose a tax on the marketplace revenues only of a hybrid platform, indeed, we show that it's gonna make it more profitable to sell own products, so instead of third parties, that means raising commissions, that was exactly what happened in France and that's gonna harm consumers. However, maybe the better way of, you know, getting rid of distortions due to hybrid mode could be having a different taxation for platform owned product versus the third party products and raising the taxes on the platform owned products could be uh, a way of getting rid of the distortion. So taxation could be an alternative uh, tool to get rid of this distortion arising from the business structure. So I think I'm good to just to conclude. So what we do again in two lines, we have a model to study e-commerce platforms where the firms are asymmetric in the terms of their size, but also in, the, in terms of timing of their moves. And this is a differentiated discrete choice model, hopefully used to study e-commerce markets. And we rely on the previous literature, you know, of the findings and the, the structures like mixed oligopoly and long run aggregative games to get the tractability to document how this hybrid mode uh, affects consumers and the third party sellers. And we show that indeed, uh, having this vertically integrated platforms is harmful to consumers compared to pure marketplaces. That's all I want to say. Thank you again very much. That's, that's great. Thank you, Özlem. Um, a quick um, clarification, perhaps, since uh, the paper has um, a 
policy motivations given the attention that some of these platforms are having in the antitrust uh, um, area and in particular the tool that enforcers are considering is not really breaking up uh, say Apple or breaking up Amazon but rather they are focusing on self-preferencing, on discrimination. So can you clarify a little bit what could an enforcer look at on the steering side? So what, what would be the right way for a regulator to make sure that bad steering doesn't happen? Oh, a bad steering doesn't happen. That's an excellent question and a tough one. Um, first of all, I think the first takeaway from this paper is that steering is not always profitable. Okay, so platform doesn't always want to sell its own products, and um, which might come as a surprise to many, uh, but it's not. If you think about that, I'm making also profits from third parties, and if they are successful, I want to sell them instead of my own products, even if we are competing, so it's better to sell them. And so whenever it is profitable, so we are in this range where the platform products are already better, either in terms of lower costs or higher commissions. And that makes things even worse. Basically, when I steer, I give myself even further incentives to sell my own products. That's a kind of a fulfilling uh, the, my incentives to sell further my products. So how can we prevent this steering? So this taxation tool, I think, is an interesting one that one can think about, like introducing differential taxation between platform-owned products and the third-party products can balance these incentives and also reduced steering incentives. I think nobody really have thought about this and we thought that that was a very interesting uh, way of thinking these problems because structural bans might have some un, you know, uh, intended consequences and which can be maybe prevented just by looking at the incentives of steering uh, for those products. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ursula. So um, we're gonna go to the third paper after a macro followed by a very IO. Now we have uh, an experiment, a more the behavioral aspect of uh, digital platforms. So the paper is going to be presented by, by, by Lena from NYU. Uh, I, I have to say that there is a, a song that people from my generation will remember, uh, Hotel California from the Eagles. And the, and the song finishes by saying, relax, we are programmed to to receive, but you can never leave. And it's, it's a little bit what these platforms are doing. They call it engagement and the economists may call it addiction. So Lena Song with Hunt Alcott and Matt Jenskow has a paper precisely on this. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tommaso, for that really awesome uh, introduction. And thank you, Andrea and, and Tommaso, for organizing this great session, uh, including our paper. So let me get right into it. Uh, as we know, social media apps and uh, smartphones have becoming increasingly important and take up a large share of people's time. So the latest number from 2020 shows that around the world, there are 4.6 billion social media users. And on average, the US uh, social media user spends about two and a half hours a day on social media platforms. Taking these numbers together may imply that uh, there's vast uh, and tremendous consumer benefits in using social media apps and our smartphones. But at the same time, many, including myself, say that we're on our smartphone and social media uh, apps too much. So related to that, there's a vibrant debate uh, in, in looking at whether uh, a discussion in looking at whether social media apps as, and uh, smartphones is addictive in the same way as uh, cigarette addiction or gambling or, uh, or, or drugs. And we're, as part of uh, our project, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to think about uh, whether that's true and quantify to what extent digital addiction contribute to our phone use. So take, for example, uh, some qualitative evidence in thinking about whether digital addiction is relevant. This is a question that we asked in, uh, in our survey asking participants, please tell us whether you think you do each of the following activity, too little, too much, or the right amount. On the x-axis, we bold a few uh, activities that may be related to smartphone use and social media use. And we can see that uh, on average, 
participants uh, seems to suggest that they think they use too much of social media and spend too much time on their smartphones, providing some evidence that people might think digital addiction is relevant. And why does digital addiction matter for us as individuals and for those uh, with children as parents? Understanding whether digital addiction exists and to what extent it affects people's phone use help us make decisions on whether or not we wanna impose limits on how much we're spending our digital devices and whether parental control is relevant in helping manage uh, the, the, the use for, for children. For Apple and Google and social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, some of them already have tools to deal with digital addiction. So for example, on Android, there's an app called Digital Wellbeing. And for I iOS, there's an app called uh, Screen Time. For these companies, uh, one of the questions could be, should they devote more resources into thinking about how to, uh, how to deal with digital addiction and how to develop these self-control tools? And related to the theme of our session and what Bruno presented earlier, these digital giants have significant market power and their decision on the design of their platform and whether or not uh, they're pushing out tools to manage digital addiction could have a large influence on how addictive these uh, products are and how they're managed. And then finally, for regulators, would regulation consume, uh, increase consumer welfare? So with all those uh, things in mind, in our paper, we try to address two research questions. First, we try to look at, are we addicted to smartphones and social media? Uh, just a quick preview, on average, we find that yes, we are. We are addicted to our, uh, to our smartphones and social media apps on our smartphones. And I will make more precise what we mean by digital addiction. The second question we try to address is how much does, does digital addiction affect our time use? And our key takeaway number is that on average, 31% uh, of our, of our uh, social media use on our smartphones can be contributed, can be attributed to uh, self-control problems. So we answer these questions by uh, building an economic model of digital addiction that captures the key components of what it means to be addictive to something, either substance or a behavior. And I, I'll describe a little bit more of that in the next few slides to uh, building on the model of digital addiction and, uh, and to, uh, to quantify the extent to which digital addiction matters, we run a field experiment with uh, smartphone users. And then finally, using our model and our, our uh, data from our experiment, we provide structural estimates to quantify to what extent uh, digital addiction affects people's time use. So let me start by giving a quick overview of the model. So as uh, there, I, I'm not going to go into the too much of the details of the model, but there are two key elements that uh, economists as well as uh, clinicians and psychologists have noted as two key characteristics that are related to addiction in other domains. The first of this is habit formation. So how much I do today, the more I do today, increase how much I would like to do something tomorrow. And the predictions from that include, for example, when a price increased today, we will see a drop in how much people use their uh, use something today, but it will also have uh, effects uh, in lowering use in future periods. So tomorrow, as well as the day after and so on. The second key element of digital addiction is self-control problems. So this is the idea that I do more, uh, I do more than what I would ideally like to do. So before uh, today, I I, uh, I I think I ideally would like to use no more than 30 minutes of Facebook, but when today actually comes, I use more than what I would ideally like to use. And what that would predict is that people would say they use more than they would ideally like to use. And then in addition, uh, for those who are at least partially aware of their self-control problems, they would want to invest in a commitment device. And then in addition, we also have our other elements in the model, including naivete uh, about, in, about, uh, about their self-control problems. And then, uh, 
a projection bias, so inattentive uh, consumers is inattentive to uh, to to a person's uh, habit formation. And we we find evidence for both of those as well. But habit formation and self control problems are the two key elements that uh, that uh, have been identified uh, as relevant for addiction. And here uh, here is what we're modeling for digital addiction as well. So let me now get into the experimental design. We recruit, unsurprisingly, and. Uh, and uh, um, and with uh, uh, with with, uh, with Facebook ads, we recruit Android users uh, and and these social media users, and U.S. adults uh, using Facebook ads. So here are two ads that we were that we used in the experiment that uh, that uh, invite participants to uh, to to uh, to uh, to start the survey and uh, partake in our in our study. As part of this experiment, we developed. Uh, a custom app called Phone Dashboard that measures how much people are using their uh, their phones. As you can imagine, this gives us a very accurate, as well as a very granular measure of how people are using their phones. And as part of the study in the uh, in the recruitment process, we invite our participants to install this app um, as part of the as part of the study. We focus on looking at a set of apps called FISBI. So these are the major, uh, major uh, social media apps, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and YouTube. We also include browsers because we were, uh, we, it is common that for people, uh, for example, on Facebook, they can use their Facebook both on the app, but also go on to their browsers to, uh, to use Facebook on their browsers. So for that reason, we include these uh, five um, social media apps, but also include browsers as part of our study uh, to focus on, of apps to focus on. As part of this uh, study, we start by recruiting participants, asking them to install phone dashboard. And then we have uh, several surveys uh, over a period of several months. So as, uh, as part of our second survey, we cross randomized participants with two different treatments. One is the bonus treatment where participants are paid money to reduce their phone use. And then the other, it's an additional function on their phone to, to, to limit how much they're using their phones. And then I can get more into more details into that uh, later. And then in period, uh, after survey three, in period three, the financial incentive becomes effective. And then we collect data uh, three weeks as well, six weeks after that. Bonus treatment, so the financial incentive that I, I just mentioned, provides a payment for participants to reduce their FISB use relative to their baseline average during a period of three weeks. So we were paying them $50 for every average hour they reduced in this time period of three weeks. So this goes down to around $2.50 for every hour participant reduced. And we pre-announced that in survey two, three weeks before this financial incentive actually become effective. The reason for that is uh, as part of uh, rational uh, habit formation, we wanna look at what happens when prices are announced in advance, and how do people respond to an anticipated price increase? So we include a price, uh, an announcement of a price increase about three weeks before, and then look at what happens in that time period before the price increase becomes effective. As part of the limit treatment, as part of a dash phone dashboard, which measures how much people are using their phone, we give some participants randomized into the limit treatment, this additional ability to impose limits on how much they're using their apps. So the way we designed this is that uh, participants can choose to impose limits on individual apps. And here I'm showing an example of a, a very strict limit on Facebook of just one minute. And here participants can choose how long they would like to use their phones. And these limits are effective the next day. So when um, the limit, a person reached their limit on a particular day, they cannot just adjust how much they're use, the, the, the limit that they preset. And then, uh, and then as, as part of this, we encourage participants within the survey to set limits on the FISB apps, the social media apps. And, uh, and walk them through the process, but they were not required or not, incent and not incentivized to set any limits on these apps. 
just to give you a quick sense of, uh, of our data, we ended up with an uh, a group of uh, participants that, uh, that were informed of treatment, just over 2,000 uh, participants. And then uh, most of us stayed with us until the end of the study, as we did a lot to, uh, to minimize attrition. To give you some uh, uh, model-free empirical results that, uh, that provide evidence for, for digital addiction. So just to give you some qualitative uh, responses here. So when we ask participants, how interested are you to set time use limits on your phone use? Um, most participants said they were at least somewhat interested in setting limits. And when we ask participants, how much would you ideally like to increase or reduce uh, their phone use in the past three weeks, almost no one said they wish they used their phone more in the past three weeks. Uh, and we see a, a, a significant proportion of them say they would actually like to reduce their phone use. And of course, one thing I wanna note here uh, that's also present in our, our, our results later is that there's significant heterogeneity. So there's a, there's a, there's a decent amount of participants who say that they actually uh, would ideally not change their phone use at all. So they're happy with how much they're using their phones. Here are some evidence for the effect of uh, the bonus on people's phone use and some evidence for habit formation. So period two is uh, when the participants knew the, uh, the, the, the price increase was coming in period three, but the price increase has not taken effect. And period three is when the price uh, increase is effective. And surprisingly, we see a large drop in how much our people are using their, their FISB apps in the period where the incentive was effective. But what provides evidence for habit formation is that even after the incentive have been removed in period four and five, we still see those in the treatment group use their FISB apps less that use in the control group. So this dissipates over time, but we still see uh, in, a, in a three week after the incentive period, we still see a reduction in how people are, are using their phone. So we, for, uh, from this, we find evidence for habit formation. And we see a little bit of a uh, drop in uh, people's phone use in anticipation of, uh, of the, the price increase, but it's much smaller than would be predicted under a, a rational habit formation model. So for that, we find all uh, evidence that there's projection bias, that people are consuming as if they're inattentive to habit formation. So now we're superimposing the, the effect of the limit function. So these are the, uh, the, the function on the apps to, to, uh, to set limits on individual apps. We see that over all the periods in which participants had access to the, uh, the limit functionality, we see a drop in how much people are using their phone relative to, to the control group. So this provides evidence that uh, not only uh, self-control problems are relevant, but also people are, uh, are partially aware of, uh, of their self-control problems. So here we see the effect uh, dissipate a little bit, but even in the final three weeks in which we collected data, we still see uh, average limit functionality reduce people's phone use about 20 minutes. In addition, when we ask participants how much are they uh, in, in a multiple price list, how much they would value the limit functionality on their phones, we see that uh, a significant number of them value their phone, uh, the limit functionality on, on a positive price. And then uh, related to the heterogeneity point earlier, there's also uh, a decent amount of them, a proportion of them who are not willing to pay any, uh, any, any money to, to keep this limit functionality. But for those who are, uh, who are willing to pay for the limit functionality, here we again find evidence for, uh, for, for wanting to have a commitment device and then uh, that self-control problems are, are relevant. So what is the effect of, uh, of uh, reduction on phone use on various outcomes that we might care about? So some of the things we ask is how much people would like to use their, their, their ideally like to use and change their, their phone use, how addicted they are to their phones. And we also collected data throughout the study using text messages. 
and ask people about their subjective well-being. So everything have been have been reoriented. So everything in the uh, uh, towards the right means that people are less addicted to their phone, happier, and um, and generally will like uh, are happy with their with their phone use. So we see that both the bonus and the and the limit treatment, uh, the reduction from those, uh, the reduction from uh, from those treatment have uh, both increased the overall survey index, which is a composite of all the five uh, individual. Uh, individual indices here have uh, have made people to be less addicted to their phones and happier with how much they're using their phone. And here I want to show you a quick uh, quick result on how uh, on who are the those who are benefiting from the bonus treatment and the and the limit functionality. And we see that there's not much heterogeneity in terms of demographic characteristics. But when we're looking at those who at the baseline wanted to restrict their phone use and report to be more addicted to their phones, it's those who are more addicted and would like to restrict more that benefit more from reducing their phone, phone uh, reducing their phone use on FISB. So this provides evidence that uh, the, the treatment, in, including the limit functionality, are well targeted. So those who know that um, who, who feel more addicted and would like to restrict more are those who are uh, benefiting more from, uh, from, uh, from, from these treatments. So finally, uh, I'm gonna present some results on uh, some summary results on our, on our model estimation counterfactuals. So what we do is that we estimate using indirect inference. So we can write out uh, the Euler equations and and characterize our structural parameters as functions of empirical <laughs> moments that, uh, that we can directly look at. For example, looking at how much the, 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 those in the bonus group, those who receive the financial incentive, have reduced their phone use in the fourth and fifth period to back out, um, back out parameters that are related to habit formation. But from, uh, from the estimated parameters, we then can predict how much our uh, what, what is the steady state co uh, consumption when, for example, we remove temptation uh, in the presence of habit formation or remove both of them? And our key headline result is that eliminating self-control problems would reduce people's physical use by about uh, 48 minutes per day, which on average is about 31% of baseline groups. And five that minutes, average, yeah, five, five minutes. Great. Right. Great, I, 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 I'm almost done. So, so the, that average of 31% of full use and 48 minutes actually mask, again, significant heterogeneity. So here we're looking at uh, the distribution of uh, self-control problems, the effect of self-control problems on people's FISB use by looking at, the, um, looking at individuals' uh, limit, uh, the, 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 how tight the limits individuals have set relative to their baseline use. We find that for some people, the effect of uh, FSB use is very small and, and, uh, and, and some uh, not at all. While as for others, there's a big right tail of individuals where FSB, uh, the effect of temptation is more than 100 minutes per day on their FSB use. So just to conclude, most people in our sample show that they wanna have better self-control tools and whether, when they're offered those tools, they use the tools and they're willing to pay for them. So digital technologies seem to involve the two aspects of habit formation and self-control problems, just like other contexts uh, that are defined as the class, uh, are defined as addictive um, and in, in, uh, in other contexts. In our model, about 31% of smartphone social media use is caused by self-control problems. And, uh, and in our, uh, we're currently working on a follow-up paper where, uh, where we're looking at different variations of how strict those uh, limit functionalities are in uh, whether or not these limits can be easily extended, uh, can affect people's phone use. And from our results so far, it seems like more robust screen time limit functionalities would uh, increase consumer welfare. So that's, that at least us the question that we posed earlier in thinking about uh, why this, this matters. 
So for socially res responsibility, uh, for socially responsible tech firms, what can they do to reduce harms, and what are the uh, what are the tools that they could uh, they could develop and implement to help people manage their digital addiction? And then for regulators, uh, if what regulation, if any, should, we, uh, should, should be considered in dealing with uh, uh, our digital addiction. So yeah, thanks so much for, for, uh, for this opportunity and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That's uh, so fascinating. There are so many questions one may want to ask. I will start from your last two questions and I relate it to your initial observation about addiction to, say, to cigarettes, to tobacco. And when we think about addiction to cigarettes, we came up with two responses. One is, let's try to give more information to people. So we write on the pack of cigarettes that smoking causes cancer. And then we realized that this kind of uh, information wasn't enough. So we started also imposing taxation or even a, a ban. So when it comes to social media, um, What's your, what's your stance? Is, is it just telling people what happens or do we start to think about taxes? And as, as you may know, you are at NYU, uh, Paul Romer has in fact said uh, that the real problem is the business model which comes from advertising and advertising needs people to be engaged and become addicted. So by taxing advertising revenues, uh, you may change the incentives to uh, engage consumers to make them addict. So since you've done this research, what's your view in the end? What are the policy tools? Information is enough or shall we really think about taxation? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. So first of all, one of the things that we see in our data, um, it's that at the baseline, even though a lot of people have these tools like digital well-being, or uh, screen time on their phones, only about 5% of them at the baseline when we recruited them were using any type of tools like that to deal with their digital addiction. And many seem to be, uh, to be aware that to be, many seem to say that they're aware that they're using their phone too much. So how, how do we square that? And part of that, uh, I think information alone may, may not be uh, may not be enough to to nudge people into um, into using using some of these tools. And part of that part of that may be related to it takes people to actually experience and play with the apps, such as now uh, when they use when they use our app phone dashboard. Many of them were actually willing to pay to to keep the functionality on their phone. So maybe it takes something like getting people to experience um, and experiment with the with the app on their phone, and then they're more likely to to continue using it in the future. So so I'm not sure I'm not sure having information alone would be enough to to make that push. And then, as you mentioned, it's a it's a great point that uh, and, and that just sort of makes what digital addiction is very interesting is that. Um, the social media platforms can can quickly adjust the design of, uh, of their product and potentially make them more or less addictive over time. So even though we can think about in other type of addictive goods, so cigarettes or alcohol, maybe maybe things can be be done to address that as well. But in the in the digital um, platform context, platforms can easily adjust uh, the design on their platform. To potentially make their their products more or less engaging, and as you mentioned, that's also related to their bottom line and their uh, advertising revenue from which they derive their majority of the revenue from. So yeah, so I, I think there's definitely scope for regulators to come in to think about whether without without regulators stepping in, the people would uh, social media platforms would actually uh, make changes that make people use their platforms less. So there's scope for, for regulators. And I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good response on whether or not imposing taxes on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, their, on their advertising revenue would be the, would be the, the first best option uh, that's available. Thanks. But I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this. <laughs> Lena, I also have a question on the, so you, you, you very convincingly argue that there is lots of cognitive limitations that people have no? when we are using smartphones and many of these digital platforms. So in a sense, your experiment, because these cognitive limitations are so diffuse, are you not underestimating the true impact 
of digital addiction in the in the sense that aren't people going to once again under under report the when you when you give them some incentives the true effects on them do you see what i mean so why should the cognitive limitation all of a sudden disappear after the experiment after you give them some some money not to be connected so if they still are cognitively limited you are likely to see under reporting of the true effects it might not Am I am I wrong? I'm not a behavioral person, but how how can you have somebody with cognitive limitation uh, ex ante, and then all of a sudden they disappear exposed uh, after a short experiment, a relatively short experiment of of a few months? So, so I, I see, I see. So as part of a part of estimates, we do think it's a, it would be an underestimation in the following sense. So when we look at the effect of our of our um, uh, of our limit function. So when we look at the the effect of this, we we have to take a uh, take a stance in some of our estimation of how much how much of the temptation is this tool removing. And under our most conservative estimate, we we assume that this is removing all the temptation. So so we can imagine suppose that it does not remove all the temptation, then that's what we where we're estimating is going to be an underestimation of how much how much uh, temptation it, uh, is contributing to people's phone use. Can I, can I ask a, a brief question? Can I ask a, a, a brief question? One. Yeah, very quick one. So, uh, you know, like going back to the cigarette example, I think nowadays, you know, we all agree that cigarettes, uh, 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 the addiction to cigarettes is bad because it has a cost for your health uh, and it also has a cost for society because, uh, you know, if you are sick, uh, then you need to be treated. What is the cost? What are the harms of digital addictions? Uh, do we know what these people do with the time uh, now that they save uh, on the internet? Are they using it in a productive way or they're using in other things which uh, are also useless? In which case, why should we bother? Right. So as part of that, that's why we're looking at the outcomes like subjective well-being, how are people feeling? And part of that, on a part of the addictive scale include things like, are your family and friends telling you you're using your phone too much and that's creating conflict? Or are you waking up to check your phone immediately uh, in the morning and then sleeping with your phone right before you go to sleep? So we can think about those uh, those kind of questions, capturing something about how using our phone, it's, it's potentially negative for people's uh, uh, interaction with others, how their sleep quality um, and how much they're engaging in other activities as well. So we we don't really have a good measure of what people are doing outside of what they're doing on their smartphones. So with our with our app, we can really accurately measure what they're doing on their phone, but not elsewhere. Uh, but we do have some qualitative evidence of people. As, at the end of our study, you said, oh, they're so glad they're part of the study. They were really happy that they were able to participate and they actually picked up a hobby or two or spent more time elsewhere and they feel they feel they're they're very glad uh, to be to be uh, to be doing this. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we understand this is very addictive, but I will encourage everybody to remain online, remain online and go on to the next session of the Royal Economic Society Conference. And I'm going to thank all our three speakers for a very nice session. Thank you, everybody. It's been fantastic. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much.